Welcome, everyone, to the G-Note Podcast. I am your host, Jason Spicy G. Goldman, and I'm a Grammy-winning record producer, arranger, and musician. I've been a music professor at USC for over 22 years, and I am most known for writing and producing music for the iconic Michael Buble over the past two decades. This is a podcast for musicians who want advice and strategies on navigating the music industry. If you're not a musician but a music fan, I promise there is plenty in here for you as well. On this pod, we talk all things music. I'll be giving you tips and life lessons I've learned over my 30 years in the business, and I'll top it off with a dash of my humble opinion. On today's pod, we are talking about one of the most important teachers I've ever had. Let's go. Explode? Really? (laughs) This was an actual comment from one of the most important teachers in my life. He's technically not even a teacher, like per se in the traditional sense, and he probably didn't and doesn't know how much of a teacher he really was to me. Before I move on, let me just say that one of the most meaningful things to me in my life, and one of the things I really truly pride myself on, is my ability to teach. I've been teaching at USC, if you've been listening to this podcast for over 22 years, I have some incredible students in the music world who I have really helped become insane musicians. I also have students I've taught who are still working to get to the highest level or not at the level, but are extremely professional and work hard and work a lot. And not all of my students become traditional working musicians. A lot of them end up becoming teachers themselves and Rather than going out there and touring and doing those types of things, they're enriching people's lives and teaching them music. And I'm extremely proud of all of these these students. The reason teaching is really so important to me, and this is actually really important, is because not only do I feel like I'm helping and making a difference, okay, I I also feel like I'm constantly learning from them and I'm growing as well. So I, I guess it's a little bit selfish in that way. I just feel that you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be in a position where I can help. And whether they know it or not, the students are always helping me. And here's what I mean by this. If you're a teacher, you kind of know this. Teaching really, in order to be, in my opinion, a really effective teacher, um, you know, you have to be able to do what you are teaching. So in other words, teaching keeps you extremely honest. As a jazz musician, I have to keep my chops up on the saxophone, even though most of the stuff that I'm doing is a lot of producing and songwriting. I still have to be able to take my horn out and play songs with the students at a high level. And trust me, if it, the students can see through all of the BS, like that, that's easy. You know, they're waiting for that first time that you screw up and then, you know, then it's like, oh, well, that cat's just all right. Um, they, they can see right through it. I've always found it difficult to take a professor serious when they're teaching something and they can't really do what they're teaching themselves. Now, that's not to say that that's always the case, but for me personally, especially in music, I've always found it difficult to really take the advice of someone that it can't really do what they're, they're teaching. So as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the most important and influential teachers that I've ever had personally Um, is a person who's not even a teacher in the traditional sense. He doesn't teach at schools or do master classes. And as a matter of fact, he's not even a musician at all. So who is this person who is so point, who so poignantly criticized my epic song explode? Well, his name is Zach Katz and he was literally one of the biggest people in the music industry. I first met him around 2010, and he was one of my best friend's managers at the time, and, he's, and he was part owner, I think he still is actually, part owner of Beluga Heights Records. Um, I, I'm super fortunate, one of my best friends in college and college roommates, and actually one of my best friends still to this day, um, is an incredible producer named J.R. Rodham, who literally found and developed Jason Derulo. He's had hits with Beyonce, Rihanna, Fall Out Boy, Britney Spears, to name just a few. JR was the person who inspired me to get into producing. Um, I went to his studio one day and he introduced me to Zach and said, if you ever need anything, Zach could help me. So of course, me always jumping on an opportunity, I took him up on that offer. 
Uh, Zach ended up moving on from management um, after a couple of years and became the president of music publishing at BMG. For those of you not familiar, BMG was one of the top uh, music publishing companies. And if you don't know what music publishing is, basically what they do is music publishers uh, ensure that songwriters receive royalties for their music. Um, they also can connect you with artists to put your songs with artists and generate basically opportunities for, for you as, as a writer. So you can see the point of why I'd want to be meeting with someone like Zach as he could potentially either offer me a publishing deal or connect me with major artists and people that could seriously advance my career. So as you can see, Zach was a very powerful player in the music industry. But I can honestly say that Zach never offered me a publishing deal. He never offered any sort of inside easy road at all, nor did he open any doors for me in the traditional sense that you may think would happen if you know someone of that stature. Um, you know, so it, it's really important that I kind of lay that foundation down because it's kind of important. So while the majority of music I do is very jazz and orchestra based, uh, at this point in my career, I was really working on honing my pop production skills. I would work all day long and at night. After me and my wife, wife would put the kids to bed, I would work on production until two or three in the morning. Um, and I would basically get songs together. So what I used to do is I used to go into BMG down on Wilshire every three to four months with a new batch of five songs and Zach would make time to listen. So here's how this would really go down because I, I really want to paint this picture properly to you. Uh, we would exchange pleasantries for about all of like two, three minutes and he would ask what I've been, you know, what I have for him. Uh, and I should note that every time I went into his top floor office, which <laughs> just so everyone knows was basically bigger than where I was living at the time, I would go in there and I would sweat profusely. He is a really very serious guy. And I'm not sure I ever even saw him smile to be quite honest with you, but he was always incredibly nice to me and generous with his time. I mean, again, it's just the president. He doesn't have to listen to my music. Right? So this is kind of how it would go down. Um, he would, he'd get, uh, he'd go, okay, show me what you got. So I, would he'd get on his phone and he'd play my first song. And this is, you know, this is how it would go. He'd, he'd turn the music on and turn the volume up at a pretty substantial level. So literally the entire floor could hear it. And while he was listening, he would always be texting, would never look up at me. He would listen usually through the end of like the first chorus, uh, and then stop the song and then literally move on to the next one and continue texting. Not a single word in between songs. He would go through all five songs and say something to the effect of, this is like at the end, it's getting better, or thanks for sharing. And thank me for coming in, and that was literally it. I would always leave there almost completely dumbfounded. He wouldn't say anything about how to improve or what I should do next. But in my head, I just kept saying, if he likes something, I'm, I'm sure he would just tell me, right? And this is where my song Explode comes into play. <laughs> Keep in mind, this was around 2013 and Katy Perry and Lady Gaga and the bubblegum dance pop thing were the rage. And just so everyone knows, I love that shit. I am a huge bubblegum pop fan. I love it to death. Let me play you a little bit of, uh, of the song. Here it is. <laughs> Man, I still think this song is so much fun. I mean, it's not, you know, something that you would use to break an artist, of course, nowadays, but it could be something great for like Disney at the park or, you know, during a parade or, or something like that. I just think it's really fun. If you want to hear the full song, including that insane bridge that I was telling you about that I didn't get a chance to play, which I still really love, actually. It's a little over the top, but I love it. Um, you could go ahead over to my website, jasongoldmanmusic.com and click on the podcast tab and it'll take you right there and you'll be able to listen to it. So definitely 2013-ish for sure, okay? Um, so I was so excited. Um, I, I had worked on the song for almost two months, which is pretty long for me to be working on a song, uh, creating this dubstepy type breakdown that happens at the bridge that really showed off my new like producer chops, like my skills, right? 
And so this is how this went down. Zach listened to literally 35 seconds of the song. Um, didn't get anywhere close to the bridge. Stops the recording. Literally, I would say right after the first few seconds of the chorus, he looks at me up from his phone and says, explode? Really? <laughs> And I just, of course, again, I'm sitting there sweating my ass off. And he literally says to me, don't bring me any more of this Britney shit. He said, this is Max Martin's lane and you are not Max. <laughs> I, you know, inside my heart was just like sinking. I mean, it was like unbelievable. For those of you who don't know who Max Martin is, you should definitely look him up. He is one of the biggest producers of all time. He has had like 25 or more number one hits on Billboard uh, Top 100, which is insane. He's responsible for like the sound of Katy Perry, Kesha, um, uh, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, you name it. He's pretty much done it. Anything that's super catchy that you've heard on the radio on repeat, it's probably a Max Martin song. And then he was like, you know, why would I want to hear a second rate Max Martin again? Like... <laughs> You know, I, inside, I was just like, oh, my God, this is like the worst thing ever. And, you know, I was basically I sunk to the floor and I even said, man, you want to hear the bridge that I worked on? It's it's really I think you're really going to like it. It's super cool. And he goes, no, thanks. <laughs> and that was it. So I would continue to bring in music to him for probably almost close to two years. And I finally got up the nerve after a, another set of five songs. And I said, man, I said, do you like any of the songs I've been showing you over the last couple of years? I said, I, I told him I was getting really frustrated. And he, this is what he said. He said this to me. This is, it's super, it's super important to me. He said, the songs are not good enough. And I, you know, I said, is the production good enough? He said, look, whether it's the production or the song, it ultimately doesn't matter. The records themselves are not good enough. And I remember asking what I needed to do. I, I said, I go, what do I need to do? And his reply was so simple. I mean, it's, it seems obvious now and I feel kind of dumb saying it, but he wrote, he, he, he said, write better songs. And, and I would learn, you know, from the meetings that I would have with him over the next several years that his answers were always like incredibly simple. And if I just thought about it for one minute, I already would have the answer, right? He would never give me exact specific things to work on. He would never, he, you know, he, he would, he actually said to me, he's like, look, I'm not a musician. I can't, I can just tell you if I hear a hit and you don't have one. And I remember saying, how can I write better songs? And I, I'm already working with some solid songwriters. And again, his simple reply was get different writers or learn how to do it yourself and be better. And me being relentless, you know, the, the relentless person that I am, I dug for specifics. And he finally said this to me. He said, where's the edge of the songs? Where's the relatability or the uniqueness? I already know what the song is about when I see the title. So why should I even listen? And, I, you know, I was like sitting in my head. I was like, man, like, really? And I said, I finally got the nerve. And I said, and I fired back at him. And I said, look, there are tons of songs out there that are not unique or edgy. And he said, those songs are typically not first hit songs for artists. Those are usually follow-up songs and third songs uh, or like third singles. And he said, um, very rarely are, are they the songs, you know, are these songs the ones that broke the artist? He said, you need to write songs that break artists because anyone can write the easy ones. So why would they need you for those? My mind was completely just blown and I just sat there just in freaking awe like, whoa. <laughs> I was just in utter shock. He said, look, ultimately the buck stops with you. You're the producer, so it's your fault if the song's great or not great. This is why he was so great in my opinion. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He was honest, he was upfront. And even though there is some subjectivity in what a hit song is, he was a top dog. He always gave it to me straight and unfiltered. And to me, that is one of the most important qualities of an incredible teacher. This allows you to get a high, to, to the higher level and fast track your career. And I totally understand that not everyone learns well from this type of a teacher. Some people don't have the stomach to take rejection, especially for, you know, for year after year. But this is the music industry and rejection is a huge part of it. Most people will tell you no until one day they don't. So you, you have to take advantage of any opportunity you have and learn and strive to be better and get to the highest level. Surround yourself with people that are better than you and learn. Don't let your ego get in the way or it will slow you down. And to me, Zach helped my career out again without him giving me anything. 
he helped my career out more than almost every teacher. And I, and I went to, you know, Berkeley College of Music for my undergrad and USC for my master's and, you know, and, and I had some fantastic teachers, but Zach was a different type of a teacher and that he was direct, honest, and it allowed me to move my career forward really, really quickly, which is really important to this day. And the fact that I can remember these meetings in such detail shows you how much respect I had for him and I had for his opinion and what he meant to me as a teacher and mentor. Folks, we are out of time for this episode. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this pod so you can stay up to date with the new shows that I'm doing, giveaways, and more importantly, concerts. You can also follow me on Instagram at SpicyGMusic or check out my website, jasongoldmanmusic.com to see what projects I'm currently working on and to see when I'll be performing next. Thanks everyone for listening. Appreciate you all. Peace. Peace.